recording now and let's dive in. So again, thank y'all. Um, thank you, Mike, for inviting me, but thank you everyone who is here in this Zoom call and everyone who will be watching this later for um, spending an hour with me as we talk about Mary Magdalene and learning about some creative biblical interpretive skills that can help remember her story for our faith today. So we're gonna start out with a little game. I'm a youth pastor and I like games and it is a little trivia game called Which Mary? that will test your knowledge about the Marys in the Christian Testament. You probably know there are a lot of them. So take a second to find a pen and paper or somewhere on your computer or a phone to jot down your answers. There are only five questions, so nothing too wild, but we'll see if you, how much you know about the Marys in the New Testament through this. Um, also, I didn't say so a second ago, um, I would recommend keeping myself muted unless you start talking because otherwise you may cough, sneeze, anything, and it may get picked up on the entire call. Um, but it looks like most of y'all are muted anyway, so I think we're good. So if you have your pen and paper down, let's get ready. The first question in our trivia game, which Mary is not a Mary in the Christian Testament? Is it Mary of Salome? Is it Mary of Galilee? Is it Mary of Bethlehem or is it Mary of Rome? Which Mary is not a Mary in the Christian Testament? The second question, what is the name of the woman who washes and anoints Jesus' feet with her hair in Luke chapter seven? Is that Mary of Bethany, Mary of Magdala, Mary of Galilee, or is it unknown? What is the name of the woman who washes and anoints Jesus' feet with her hair in Luke 7? Our third question is similar. What is the name of the woman who anoints Jesus' head with oil in Mark 14 and Matthew 26? What is the name of the woman who anoints Jesus' head with oil? Is it Mary of Bethany? Is it Mary of Magdala? Is it Mary of Galilee? or is it unknown? Question number four, how many mothers named Mary were there in the Christian Testament or the New Testament? You'll hear me say Christian Testament a lot tonight. That's kind of my preferred language for New Testament, but either works. Were there four, three, two, or one mothers named Mary in the Christian Testament? And last, but certainly not least, who was the first person to proclaim Christ's resurrection? Was it Peter? Was it Paul? Was it Mary Magdalene? Or was it John? So if you're ready, we'll, we'll let you self-grade, no accountability if you lie about your answers and how many you got right. But let's see, how much do you know about the Marys in the Christian Testament? First, which Mary is not a Mary in the Christian Testament? That's B, Mary of Galilee. I totally made that up. Um, there are Mary of Salome, Mary of Bethany, and Mary of Rome throughout Christian traditions. Um, Luke 10 says Mary and Martha lived in Galilee, but it says they lived in Bethany elsewhere. So no one really talks about her as Mary of Galilee. I made that up. The others are all real, however. Number two, who is a woman who washes and anoints Jesus' feet in Luke 7? That is unknown. All Luke says about this woman is that she was a repentant sinner. That's all we know about her. A lot of people assume she was a prostitute, but as we'll see, there's not even a whole lot of grounds for assuming that she was a prostitute. That's just a guess. We actually don't have a name for this woman in Luke 7. And then number three, who was the woman who washed or anoints Jesus' head in Mark and Matthew? That is also unknown. So this woman is never named in either of these accounts. Um, both stories say that this took place in Bethany. So some people in Christian tradition pretty quickly assumed that this was Mary of Bethany, which is the same Mary that was sister to Martha and Lazarus. But there was more than one woman named, or one woman in Bethany though. So there's no reason to assume that this woman was Mary of Bethany just because it was another woman in Bethany. This woman is unknown. Um, and also I want to point out now that you can see that this story in Mark and Matthew is different from the story in Luke. Um, in Luke, it's a woman who's a repentant sinner who washes and anoints Jesus' feet. Mark and Matthew, it's a woman who anoints Jesus' head with oil. So some people think it may be different tellings of the same story. Some people think they're two different stories. But what I want you to know right now is neither of them are Mary Magdalene. They're both unnamed women. And moving on to question four, how many mothers named Mary were there in the Christian Testament? There were at least four. So we can find Mary, mother of Jesus, of course, 
mother of James, mother of Joseph and John Mark. Um, and many of these women, those last three, were all some of the women who stuck by Jesus as he was crucified, while most of his other followers, including all of the men that followed him, fled. Number five, who was the first person to proclaim Christ's resurrection? That is Mary Magdalene. So in all of the gospel, she is one of the first people or among the first people to find the empty tomb. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, she's with some other women. Um, and those, they only discover the empty tomb, though Matthew writes a narrative of them encountering Jesus. Um, but in the Gospel of John, it tells a story a little bit different. Mary goes to the tomb alone um, on the third day when she encounters the resurrected Jesus, who at first she doesn't res recognize, um, but then she talks with him and then goes to the other disciples saying, I have seen the Lord. Um, and a lot of scholars think that this is the most original story of the resurrection, that Mary was the first person to say, I have seen the Lord. So we'll unpack a lot of this stuff tonight, but how, I'm wondering, how much of this was a surprise? If you had to rate your knowledge about Mary Magdalene between one and 10, what do you think it would be? I'd love to see some answers in chat, or you can say something out loud if you'd want. I see a three. Hopefully we can bring that up to at least a seven tonight. Three, four, two. I think you may know more than that, but I like the dot, 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 dots. Yeah, so a lot of us, we, what, we may know something about who we've been told Mary is, um, but I think there's a lot to learn about Mary Magdalene. This is some of what we're going to do tonight. So I want to offer a quick roadmap about our time for the next 50 minutes or so. Um, so we'll start off looking a bit more about the facts that we have about Mary Magdalene's life um, and look at some of this, the way in which her story has been confused and conflated over the past two millennia. Um, and then about 730, we'll switch gears. It may feel like a sudden turn, but it'll all make sense in the end um, towards looking at the, this body of literature and scholarship called feminist biblical interpretation. Um, we'll talk about some of the hallmarks of it or some of the tools it has to offer us. So tonight will be very much two pronged. We're going to spend the first half talking about Mary Magdalene and then switch to the second half to talk about this thing called feminist biblical interpretation. So that next week when we come back together next Monday night, we can take these two things and blend them together and use these tools to study and poke and prod and learn more about what the story of Mary Magdalene is and what it can mean for us in our faith today. So I want to get out of the gate saying um, I have two sources that I'm really pulling a lot of this information from. Um, the first is a book called The Resurrection of Mary Magdalene by Jane Schaberg. Um, and the second is one called Wisdom Ways, interpreting or introducing feminist biblical interpretation by Elizabeth Schuchler Fiorenza. So both of these books are somewhat seminal books in feminist biblical scholarship, and they were textbooks of mine in seminary. So I spent a bit of time with them, um, and especially Elizabeth Schuchler Fiorenza's book. It is a go-to if you want to learn about feminist biblical interpretation, and 10 out of 10 would recommend having a copy, but we will look at a lot of that material tonight. So Let's dive into some conversation about Mary Magdalene, first with a quick field trip to one of my places in Kansas City, as many of you know, the Nelson Atkins. So one of my favorite paintings there is this painting, The Penitent Magdalene, um, by the Greek Renaissance artist El Greco. Um, we think this painting was made somewhere between 1580 and 1585, um, and it's beautiful. I love how vivid the colors are. I love the strange dimensions, um, the mysterious gaze, and how compelling it is. Um, but I don't want to focus on the great things I love about it tonight, even though I could talk about it for a while. I want to bring it up because there is a couple like problems I have with this image. First, we could talk about how Mary was not this white nor this blonde. Um, it's common and good sometimes to imagine biblical characters in our own world, um, but the reality is Mary Magdalene probably looked a bit more like this image. This is a icon made contemporary, I'm not sure how old it is, um, by a religious artist named Robert Lentz. I think it's gorgeous. I have a copy of it on my wall at home and it's like my favorite piece of art. Um, but the back of this says something about how important it is to remember that the women and the people who started the Christian faith looked like this. They were Middle Eastern, um, especially with all the things that are going on over there globally right now. But 
more pertinent to our conversation tonight is a different problem I have with this image and this painting and its story. Um, and that's the way in which it characterizes and maybe even reduces Mary Magdalene to this concept of repentance. So the title, the penitent Magdalene, penitent is a fancy word for repentant, um, like forgiven. Um, and you see in the gallery label, which I've included on this slide, um, that she is called a reformed prostitute who washed and anointed Christ's feet, leading him to pardon her sins. Um, and you see in the image to the right, you see her long hair, a sign of that story from Luke 7, and that vial of ointment as another sign of that story, um, along with the school that represents Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But as our trivia game just helped us to see, the reformed woman who anointed Jesus and washed his feet was not Mary Magdalene. That was another unnamed woman. Um, but as this painting shows us, Throughout history, stories of Mary Magdalene have become, become conflated with stories of other women, many of whom were unnamed. And what we have now is less a uh, historical Mary Magdalene in our cultural imagination and more a constructed Mary of amalgamation or this Mary who's an amalgam or combination, this like conflation of all these different stories. So we're gonna look a little bit on this tonight before switching to some hallmarks of feminist biblical interpretation. So let's start, where is Mary in the Christian Testament? It, it turns out there are only 12 pieces in the New Testament, 12 verses that name Mary Magdalene by name. It's not much, but this is also more than any other woman in the New Testament, except for Mary, the mother of Jesus, and most, more than most of the 12 apostles that follow Jesus. So she doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but relatively she gets a bit. Um, but as you'll see by that list, 11 of these 12 references are at the stories of Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Um, so 11 out of the 12 times Mary Magdalene is mentioned, it's at that scene, in during Jesus' passion. And then one other time she is mentioned in Luke 8, simply introduced as one of Jesus' followers, out of whom seven demons had been cast out. So Luke 7, which comes right before Luke 8, um, and Mark 14 and Matthew 26 are not connected at all to Mary Magdalene in the Bible. It's only later in Christian tradition that those stories started to become conflated. So how did we get here? This is one of the driving questions in that book, The Resurrection of Mary Magdalene by Jane Shaberg, which we'll look at probably more next week. But a lot of what I'm about to offer comes from her digging through the history of Mary Magdalene and wondering how we went from these 11 mentions of her at Jesus' death and resurrection to this image of her being the reformed prostitute with long hair. So starting off there, as you probably already know, were a lot of Marys in Jesus' times. We're not really sure why it was such a common name, but one idea is um, that people were named after Miriam the Hasmonean, who was a Jewish woman married to Herod the Great in 37 BCE and murdered by him eight years later. Um, and so the name became associated with the hopes of Hasmonean nationalists and sympathizers for independence. And people think that's why a lot of people name their daughters Mary or Mary something. Um, so much though, so much that there was up to a quarter of the women in Jesus' time with the name Mary. Some estimates say 23% of women had the name Mary in their names, kind of like Elizabeth or even Mary today. Um, but it's more than just a common name in the New Testament. The stories that have become conflated into this legend of Mary Magdalene do have some distinct elements in common. Um, so first I wanna look at the anointing. Um, the stories in Luke 7, Mark 14 and Matthew 26 are stories of a woman anointing Jesus. Um, and to further complicate things, Mark and Matthew, Jesus says that he has been anointed for his burial. So that has some major parallels to the images of Mary Magdalene um, in the end of all the gospels in which she is going to Jesus' tomb at one point to anoint his body as it is dead. Um, so there is scenes of Mary anointing Jesus' body after death. And for whatever reason, these have become conflated and like married to these other stories because of an anointing element. Um, and then second, there's also a parallel in these stories that are of Mary Magdalene and then these stories of unnamed women who have become conflated. There's this element of repentance or exorcism or forgiveness. So in Luke 7, we are told that the woman who washes Jesus' feet is a repentant sinner. There's no implication of her being a prostitute, but that's what most people assume she was for whatever reason. Um, so Luke 7, the woman is a sinner. Mark 14 and Matthew 26, that story, which is pretty similar, that woman is not a sinner. She's not named 
ashamed as a sinner at all. In fact, it ends both of those stories with Jesus saying that whenever the gospel is preached, it will be preached in remembrance of her, in memory of her. This woman is not a sinner, but because it's so similar to Luke 7, people have understood that that was just a prostitute anointing Jesus in all three of the accounts. Um, so we look at Luke 8, 2, and then it's, there's a similar note in Mark 69, in which it's told us that Mary Magdalene had had seven demons cast out of her, um, that she had been exercised by Jesus before she had joined his movement. So this note is so brief, and it's not that common in any like historical evidence outside of the Bible that a lot of scholars, including James Shaberg, say that this may not have been real. There may not have been an original tradition in which Mary Magdalene had had demons cast out of her, and instead this might have been added into the biblical account as a polemic against those who asserted that Mary Magdalene had more of a role in early Christianity. So we don't know if this actually happened, but it's in most of our Bibles today. Um, and for that reason, it has she's been associated with this other repentant sinner. She had a demon cast out of her. And to further complicate the matter, um, people assume that a woman who had demons cast out of her had, had sexual sins cast out of her. Jane Shaver like kind of talks about this and saying, what demon? We, we aren't told, but what kind of demons would a woman have? Sexual, of course. So because of these vague similarities throughout time, whether intentionally or unintentionally, the st these stories became conflated and Mary became this amalgamation of many different women that we have in the New Testament. So um, we see traces of this throughout the first hundred year, first few hundred years of Christianity, and it's really established by 500 CE. Um, the first like instance we have of this uh, conflation is in 207 CE in which a church father named Tertullian um, is writing in a biblical commentary about Luke 7 and makes reference to her being Mary Magdalene. That's the first historical note we have of Mary Magdalene being that woman in Luke 7. For 200 years, we don't have any evidence of them being the same person or any hints of that. But notes like that started to become more and more popular. Um, and by the 500s, we see people talking about Mary Magdalene as this amalgamation, this conflation. There's a uh, a bit of a sermon preached by Pope Gregory the Great in the late 500 CE in which he talks about Mary Magdalene introducing her as a sister Martha and Lazarus um, and describing her as the sensual woman who repented of her sins by washing Jesus feet with her hair um, and the rhetoric he used in that sermon was clearly an appeal to get others to repent from their own sin and really reduces Mary Magdalene to her former sexuality even if it's not her sexuality anymore um, and it's here that we start to see this idea of Mary being the penitent Magdalene. So we can guess that maybe some of this was an accident, that people were just kind of getting confused because that's what happens as we go throughout time. But we know that official church leaders had reason to talk about Mary Magdalene and comment on her authority within the early church. Because throughout the first few hundred year, centuries of Christianity, there were other groups um, that we now call Gnostic We'll look more at that term next week for those of you who may not be familiar with Gnosticism, Gnostic Christianity. Um, but there were a bunch of these streams within early Christianity that were dismissed as heretical, as false by official church authorities. And in many of these streams, people talked a lot more about Mary Magdalene, talked about her importance and authority in the early church, and did so for hundreds of years without ever talking about her as the reformed woman or talking about her as this reformed prostitute from Luke 7. But Nevertheless, this amalgamation, this conflation is what took place. Um, and by the time the Roman Empire fell, a lot of these Gnostic groups, alternative early Christian groups died out, um, as did their take on who Mary Magdalene was. And as legends continue to grow, as they did about many saints throughout the Middle Ages, it became pretty much canon that Mary Magdalene was this woman who was Mary and Martha's sister, this repentant prostitute, everything. So we can open up this book called The Golden Legend. It's a a medieval book that was a collection of hagiographies or like legendary biographies of saints. Um, it, it, like it was one of the go-to. If you want to know who a saint was throughout Christian mythology, you go to this book, The Golden Legend. Um, it was originally collected in the late 1200s, but edited throughout all of medieval Europe. Um, and it tells us the following. So I'll offer everything it says. Um, that she was the Mar Mary, Mar Mary Magdalene was the sister of Martha and Lazarus, that she was born to royal and wealthy parents, that she had abandoned her body to pleasure so much so that she was no longer called by any other name than the sinner before repenting, 
This book tells us that Mary Magdalene had repented not on her own accord, but by divine inspiration at a Pharisee's house where Jesus was dining and she bathed his feet with tears and ointment. And after being forgiven, it says that Mary Magdalene received special attention and affection from Jesus, that she was by his side during his crucifixion and burial and was the first to whom the risen Jesus appeared. That's the first thing this actually got right from the biblical narrative. Um, and then lastly, this golden legend tells us that in the early church, she was a teacher and a leader, though it doesn't comment on any special authority, and that she spent her last 30 years living in isolation, contemplating the things of God, not teaching, but just contemplating things on her own. So there is a lot that people understood Mary as by this point. And we see in the golden legend with that note about her receiving special attention and affection, the beginnings of this idea that maybe she was in some romantic or sexual relationship with Jesus, which is what a lot of people talk about now. You may have heard me playing a Jesus Christ Superstar song before people we set, started with this presentation. Um, that's something that people are more curious about in the modern imagination of Mary Magdalene, but it has roots back to um, this literature from the 1200s. So we can look at this story of Mary's conflation throughout history and guess that it was an accident. This type of stuff happens over history, but the more we look at it, the more it looks like something is up. Um, feminist scholars like Jane Schaberg are wary from the beginning of this history and see comments like Gregory the Greats and how she, he talked about Mary Magdalene as uh, representing this desire to discredit and silence women's authority in the early church. And by blending these stories together and turning Mary Magdalene into um, this woman who encountered Christ at his resurrection and reducing her to the repentant prostitute, church leaders could turn her story into one of repentance, emphasizing her sexuality and discrediting her potential to authority. Um, Jane Schaberg explains it this way. She says, what a woman thinks and what she has to say can be every bit as alarming as her genital sexuality. The heightening of and focus on her sexuality may have been a way of deca decapitating her removing her mind, her identity, her voice. So she's suggesting that there was this somewhat intentional move from taking Mary into the stories we have for in the New Testament to reducing her to this prostitute, to sexualize her and dismiss her authority in the early church. Again, there were a lot of Gnostics who argued that Mary was more important in the beginning of the church, almost like parallel to Paul or Peter. Um, if she was the first person to announced that Christ was resurrected and had some sort of leadership in the early church, I think it's a good question why she is not uh, more parallel to Paul and Peter, why it's not Paul, Peter, and Mary, not like the folk band, but like the ancient Christians, and why we don't know more about her and her role in the early church. So some people may say that God simply wanted it this way, that it was divine guidance that pushed Mary to the sidelines, but others are suspicious of this simple logic. And Jane Schaberg says that she doesn't think this amalgamation was fully intentional nor fully accidental. She says, what we are looking at and for is not conspiracy, but neither is it a series of innocent mistakes and confusions. The whole process may be in its beginnings one of willful interpretation or misinterpretation to suit the purposes of an aesthetic church. So she talks about how she's, Mary Magdalene's story is really one that's present to Jesus' body in the middle of his suffering and death. She is the one who sticks with Jesus throughout his death until his resurrection. She talks about how the church, as it grew older in the first few hundred centuries of Christianity, became more and more ascetic. Um, resistant to the body. And uh, we see this even in the New Testament, that the flesh is bad and the spirit is good. And as that notion gained more traction in early Christianity, Mary Magdalene's story and influence was dangerous because it talked more about a more embodied presence with suffering and death and not this aesthetic resistance to the body. And it was a resistant stream to the patriarchal culture that grew within early Christianity. Um, we see for the beginning of Christianity was a little more egalitarian, but as it got older and older, it gave more and more into the patriarchy of the world around it. Um, Jane Schaberg points out that what role women had in the creation of the legends and how they heard them may be a noble, but one fact remains that every prominent stream of theology and practice within early and later Christianity that supported women's leadership was sharply opposed, even described as heretical. Um, so she talked to how Mary Magdalene and the shifting and this manipulating of her story, somewhat intentional, somewhat accidental throughout history, allowed church leaders um, to turn her into this repentant prostitute to dismiss um, both this more embodied Christianity and a Christianity in, in which women had more authority.
Um, so I really like what Jane Shaberg says in this quote. She says, Mary Magdalene is the mad woman, angry mad in Christianity's attic. She was hidden there because of an open and not fully appreciated secret and its implications. But at Christianity's core, the male disciples fled and the women did not. So I've just opened up a can of worms about the history and story of Mary Magdalene, for which I hope you've heard a lot. Um, but next week, we will take this further, poke and prod, especially at some of this, the ways in which Mary Magdalene's become the mad woman of Christianity's attic. Um, we'll kind of explore more how it is that it was suppressed and resisted her story and what that means for us today. But before we unpack all of this history of Mary Magdalene, I want to offer us some tools to do so through this lens called feminist biblical interpretation, because um, I believe it's these tools that are kind of necessary to help us see Mary Magdalene's story more fully and with a potency for our own faith, our own understanding of the Bible, and our own understanding of Christianity today. So we're going to move now to talk about some hallmarks of feminist biblical scholarship, but before we do, I want to have a break for any questions. So do any of y'all have any questions you'd like to ask? You can throw them in the chat or unmute yourself and say something. So Tyler? Yeah. So Mary Magdalene was not the sister of Martha. No. That We see that by 500 CE. We see people start talking about that, but that is um, in the New Testament, critical scholars see it, them as very distinct people. Um, and it wasn't until like four or 500 that that was even hinted. Are there any other questions before we move on? Cool. So we're going to turn now to the second half of this class, this first class, um, and look at some of the hallmarks or some of the tools, some of the highlights of feminist biblical interpretation, um, so that next week we can take these tools and go back to the story of Mary Magdalene, poke it and prod it, we can remember her um, in a way that I think has incredible implications for how we understand Christianity today, in 2020, in Kansas City or wherever we may be. Um, so to start- Hi. Yeah. Um, I think that um, Kay had a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kay, Sorry. you have a question? No, thanks, Sarah. She just happened to be one of the lucky five that I can see your face in. I was about to say, I can only see like six of y'all, okay. so. Tyler, I, I was raised Lutheran, and therefore all the stories about how all these biblical people got to all over the earth and all the stories they have about them now, I never knew until I grew up. Mm -hmm. But when I was questioning how Mary Magdalene got to this town in France where I was, I came home and started researching it. And, and it said, uh, as it always says, according to tradition, mm -hmm. that Mary Magdalene had come with two of the disciples over to the wooded area of this town in France where she died. And then they put her body in the church there. Mm -hmm. But th they never have any real facts. That's just always according to mm -hmm. tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we're going to see more about how tra that, like tradition isn't a singular thing. It's, it's a plural thing. And um, right. that's not necessarily a bad thing. And once we address that, I think there's some freedom in that. And that's okay. kind of, kind of the crux of some of feminist biblical interpretation, right. Right. but okay. yeah, exactly. What tradition, whose tradition, which tradition. <laughs> Cool. So we are going to turn to the Bible for the next couple of minutes to look at a verse that kind of helps us illustrate or see the issue that feminist biblical interpretation seeks to acknowledge, uh, respond to, and find opportunity in. So one of my favorite books in the New Testament is the book of First Corinthians. Um, it's got a lot of stuff in there. Um, towards the end in chapter 14, the Apostle Paul lists a bunch of instructions for how the Corinthian church should structure their worship. Um, and towards the end of that chapter, we see this little verse or couple verses that are put in parentheses. Some people believe that they were added later by someone who wasn't Paul, um, but nevertheless, it's in most of our Bibles and it's a verse we need to deal with. And it says, like in all the churches of God's people, the woman should be quiet during the meeting. They are not allowed to talk. Instead, they need to get under control, just as the law says. If they want to learn something, they should ask their husbands at home. It's disgraceful for a woman to talk during the meeting. Mm 
Whoa. I don't know about you. I'm glad to be at a church that knows it's not disgraceful for a woman to talk during church. So take, I would love for a couple to hear a couple responses. What do you think? Like, whoa, what's your reaction to this passage? What do you think we should do with this scripture? So take a second, answer that for yourself, throw something in the chat or feel free. Um, one or two of y'all to say something aloud, but Tyler. what do you think we should do? Yeah. Tyler, um, I was a Lutheran for about 18 years and that was their philosophy. Mm -hmm. And women are not allowed to speak in church. Those of you who know me knew that did not last long. <laughs> and um, I eventually left because I got tired of being quiet. But that's their philosophy. But uh -huh. we uh -huh. also had the church with the Missouri Synod, but the church had been started in Haven, Kansas, which is a Mennonite community. So you had both philosophies mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. church where women had to be silent. Yeah, so there are plenty of people who still listen to this. That's uh, the church I grew up in, like talked about this verse and it was like, well, women can talk, but they're not supposed to teach. So like I had a youth pastor who was a woman growing up, but whenever we really started teaching, it was the men who could do it. Like during baptism, she kind of had to stand there awkwardly behind us and she couldn't lay her hands on us. It was, they, they, they learned to believe in this verse with some nuance that was yeah. more complicated than helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see someone in the chat said this verse is a reason I never like Paul. I have a love-hate relationship with Paul for the same reason, but there is some hope in the thought that this might not have been Paul himself, but someone else who added it. This is this is Vicky, and I I don't I don't know why I can't I type some in the chat, but I can't get it to go. So, um, I think this is a reflection of the complete context of life in these times. You know, women were not in the, in the public sector at all. So why would the church be any different? And surely if you look at the synagogue, the women and men were separated. If you look at the Muslim faith. So I think it's, I think it's very much a product of the political time that women were not expected to speak. They were expected to be chattel and to perform duties. And I, uh, so my reaction is good grief, but what I think we should do with this scripture is take it as a reminder that there are many people who still feel this is an appropriate response to women in church. And that, that is so prevalent to me, having come from the Catholic tradition, where two popes ago, Benedict XVI tried to silence all of the women religious and take away their actual um, tangible um, wealth, their hospitals. He tried to take that away from them. Oh, wow, yeah. And so what should we do with the scripture? We should take it as, uh, take it to heart as a warning that there are many people that still feel in some ways that this is a truth. And I think it's a part of, you know, how old politics influences current politics. If you look at politics in the small, you know, small, small uh, politics, not, not partisan, but small politics. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. That's it's a reminder that this energy is not gone, especially because we still see it in there. Um, and Lexi, I see your chats about how this follows the theory of how there was and is an intentional movement to dis diminish voices of women in the church, or maybe this was a, an effort to tamper down the revolutionariness of Jesus in his early time to make it more digestible politically. Lexi, maybe you should go to seminary. You sound just like all of us who have. Yes, yes, yes. So there's a lot of things that we may think or do or respond. I know this verse can bring up a lot of memories and baggage that a lot of us have in the church. A lot of feminist biblical and interpretation will kind of acknowledge some baggage and some um, difficult history some of us have with the church. So um, that's, that's good. That's where I think God offers some transformation. But Mary Magdalene, or sorry, Elizabeth Schuchler Ferenza in her book, Wisdom Ways, Introducing Feminist Biblical Interpretation, uses this verse to really highlight the problem um, and to develop the type of paradigm that she says we need to read the Bible um, that's the most transformative. So she works through a few different paradigms Christians have used to read the scripture throughout history um, that are good, but kind 
kind of insufficient in the face of verses like this. So I'm going to talk about a few paradigms and then offer the one that she offered and then unpack it through some hallmarks. So the first paradigm with which we may read the Bible um, is viewing the Bible as revelation, to view it, the Bible as a source of God revealing something to us. This may be a more literal or a more layered thing as we may see it as the Bible is literally God's revelation to us. And when we read it, God is directly speaking to us. Or we more ha may have a more nuanced understanding of this, that God reveals God's self through our encounter with the text gradually, but still that one way revelation. So either of those ways, viewing the Bible as revelation would go to 1 Corinthians 14, this verse, and say that this was revealed by God and we should listen to it, or that someone thought it was revealed by God and we don't really have to listen to it anymore. Um, but it kind of leaves us with this, like we listen to it or we don't, it doesn't get us much further. So there's another paradigm we might use to read the Bible. Um, and Tushla Lepernza talks about how we might read the Bible as history or fact, um, rather as a literal record of history all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And the creation story was literally six days to a more layered like tool to understand history by reading the Bible and learning more about the historical realities of the people who produced it and such. Um, and so this paradigm, knowing that the Bible can help us learn more about history or what actually happened, would read this verse and see that it was a fact about the early church that women, people believe women should be silent and that we can either listen to it or write it off as an outdated way of believing and doing things that we, we've grown and history has changed since then. But that is a part of our history, which is important, but still is it as transformative as it could be? So it just kind of leaves us with this take it or leave it um, mentality. So a third paradigm with which we may approach the Bible, um, instead of focusing on what it reveals to us from God directly or about history, instead highlights or emphasizes the Bible as inspiring, as culturally significant, as having beauty or aesthetic value. Um, we have heard all heard the Bible called the good book. I think that really like names this type of paradigm, in which the Bible is inspiring, um, maybe not the inerrant word of God, maybe not direct revelation, and maybe inspiring for people who aren't Christian and don't believe in God, um, but it's beautiful, inspiring. Um, and thus, when we see verses like this, if we're working from this paradigm, we'll see it and say, okay, well, we can eat the meat and spit out the bones of the Bible. Let's just focus on other more inspiring passages before and after this verse, like 1 Corinthians 13, which happens right before this and is one of the most beautiful passages in Christian scripture. So Elizabeth Shushlufranza details all of this and how all of these are helpful paradigms and necessary at times, but for verses like 1 Corinthians 14, 33, and through 35, they don't go far enough. They kind of give us this like, well, we're going to take it or we're going to forget it, but we're kind of stuck in some ways. So she proposes a new paradigm that feminist biblical interpretation uses. And I think a lot of us who read the Bible in different ways use this type of paradigm in which the Bible isn't simply revelation, fact, or inspiration, but it is a site for transformation. It's something that we read and wrestle with. And out of that encounter, we are transformed and encounter God and grow. So the word of God doesn't come to us directly from the Bible, but out of our encounter with it, our transformation with it. So she uses a big word for this and she calls it a rhetorical emancipatory paradigm. If that word's not helpful for you, just forget it. But it's talking about how the Bible is a rhetorical work. It is written to inspire, persuade, and to compel um, and that we should read it and sometimes read against it with an emancipatory ethos, looking for ways in which our encounter with scripture can lead to a more emancipated life and world against the systems of oppression and injustice that harm so many people in our world. So this paradigm approaching to 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, wouldn't just throw it out because it's oppressive or outdated, but rather it would focus in on verse this verse and verses like it and see it as an opportunity to ask why the church operated this way, what we can learn from this history, how we might create a new type of church in our world. Um, and it would ask too, what were the women saying in the Corinthian church that led to people wanting to silence them? It would see this verse and say like, okay, well, if women had to be told to be silent, that means they weren't. That means they were speaking, they were teaching, they were asking questions. And this rhetorical emancipatory paradigm leans into that 
and wonders what they were saying and what that might mean for us today. So Schuschler Forenza talks about how this approach to the Bible isn't so interested in like dogmatic proof or like simple edification or facts, but rather it investigates the ways in which the Bible, biblical texts exercise influence and power in social and religious life. So it really seeks to take seriously how we come to the Bible from our own social location, how social dynamics influence the Bible and how we can acknowledge that and be liberated from it. So this is a, this paradigm is really at work in a lot of what we call contextual biblical theologies or scholarships. Um, so we can talk about like, uh, like queer biblical scholarship or black biblical scholarship and all these types of biblical scholarships seek to read from a certain social location with this rhetorical emancipatory ethos, wrestling with the text, acknowledging the social location so that we can find more freedom and more justice and more liberation. So I'm gonna introduce to you five hallmarks of feminist biblical interpretation. Then after this, I'll move us to conclude and offer an exercise you can do on your own to kind of unpack some of this. Um, but these five hallmarks will kind of help us unpack this rhetorical emancipatory paradigm or this paradigm in which the Bible isn't this simple thing, but this thing with which we wrestle with and out of this emerges a divine transformative experience. So I'm gonna go through these. This, if it's not fire hydranty yet, this will be a little bit and afterwards I'll take some questions so if you have any questions hold on to them throw them in the chat after these five I'll get to them um, and then we'll move to conclude and leave you with some questions to hopefully get answered next week so first and foremost feminist biblical interpretation seeks to expose gender dynamics it sees and exposes how gender dynamics are baked into every aspect of our system and even into scripture so Whenever you read anything from feminist biblical interpretation, it's gonna start off by acknowledging that gender is a reality that affects everything in our life and in our scripture, everything in between. It's, we often talk about in feminist biblical interpretation, acknowledging that the Bible is androcentric um, it's a male-centered text. Androcentrism is a fancy word for male centrism. Um, the Bible, all of the most, if not all of the authors of the Bible were men. Most of the main characters are men. Most of the first readers of it or the audience is often assumed to have been men. It's an androcentric text. So feminist biblical scholarship seeks to acknowledge that, not just as a way to dismiss it, but as a way to move past it and find a more liberative and more freeing um, and a more just interpretation of these texts. So because the Bible is androcentric and because even so much of our world is androcentric. When we talk about people, a lot of times we talk about mankind or men, um, which could be used for a certain gender or could be used for everyone. Um, feminist biblical interpretation seeks creative ways to kind of like snap ourselves out of this androcentrism. Think in more expansive ways in which men are not at the center, but a more egalitarian way of thinking about the world. So some of this takes place through some creative language tools. Um, a couple of words on your screen now, women and kiriarchy are two ones that you see all over feminist biblical interpretation. Um, so first, you'll see a lot of times feminist biblical scholars, some of the quotes I've shared tonight, say women with the dash, W-O dash slash M-E-N, um, as an alternative to both like words like man and mankind, which a lot of us use humanity, stuff like that now. Um, but some feminist biblical scholars will say women to talk about an expansive humanity, but reminding us that, that includes women too, or they'll use this just as a um, replacement for women itself um, to show that this interpretation doesn't just read for women who are on one half of the gender binary, but reads for everyone who doesn't have the elite male privilege um, that rules the androcentric world. So when we talk about women, we don't just talk about a certain gender, but we talk about everyone who is subjected by patriarchy, by misogyny. Um, so that includes like queer, LGBTQ men, for example, gay men, trans men, um, men who don't have the same male privileges that a lot of men have, who are still victims of this world that often gives men more power than women. So to kind of unpack that, there's this other word that I like a lot. If you like it, hold on to it. If you don't, let go of it. But this word kiriarchy, which is kind of an alternative for the word patriarchy. Um, so both of those words use the word Greek. Patriarchy uses the word pater, which was Greek for father. Kiriarchy switches, switches it to um, the Greek word kyrios, kyrios, which means Lord. Um, so it's like lordiarchy. So instead of talking about the patriarchy in which men have more power than women, the kyriarchy 
acknowledges that it's not just men that have more power, um, but it's who Elizabeth Shushla Ferenza calls the Lord, slave master, husband, elite freeborn, property, the educated gentleman to whom disenfranchised men and all women were subordinated. So when we talk about the karyarchy, we're not just talking about the simple binary where men have more power than women. We're talking about this complex pyramid of social domination, of oppression, in which it's like the Lord, like men with a lot of power and property and social like uh, currency who are on top of this complex pyramid. And we know this. We know that a man who is super impoverished doesn't have the same social power that a wealthy woman has. Um, we know that like a queer man often doesn't have the same power that a straight man has. So we see these unequal inequalities all throughout society. And it's not as simple as saying one type of person has more power than another person. And the word karyarchy um, seeks to call, like conjure that whenever we're talking about um, the systems of oppression and injustice in our world. So um, she jokes about how both of those words are kind of like spiritual exercises. Elizabeth Schuschler Friorenza says that we should use these for like the next hundred years or so to kind of rewire our cultural brain to move away from the androcentrism in the world. So that was a lot. Basically, feminist biblical interpretation asks for readers' experience in relationship to the text. It elevates our experiences of gender, of class, of economics, of race, of ethnicity, of everything, um, and seeks to acknowledge that as we interpret the text. So it asks questions like, does this text resonate with one of your individual experiences? What kind of group experiences are triggered by the text? Do one's experiences suggest a certain interpretive approach to this text? Um, and by asking about experience, um, the goal is liberation from oppression. Elizabeth Schuschler Ferenza talks about how the choreography of oppression must be named a structural sin, that it is sin of the systems of oppression in our world are sins from which we must repent. And one way to do so is naming them, seeing them, letting that impact our uh, interpretation of the Bible and finding new and more just ways of reading the Bible and creating communities in light of that. So feminist biblical interpretation first exposes gendered experience. Second, feminist biblical interpretation reads to make meaning or to be transformed, not to be right. Um, feminist biblical interpretation does not seek one right way to understand scripture, but rather seeks this meaning making that um, is looking for a deeper understanding and profound insight, not just into the Bible, but also into the self and the world and to how to engage in struggles for survival and justice. So this feminist biblical interpretation is not interested in it interested in providing the correct and true interpretation of a text it says that there really usually isn't one. Um, it does not reduce divergent feminist biblical interpretations to some single meaning and then judge them as either right or wrong. Rather, it insists that all interpretations must be assessed for how they can make conscious and overcome internalized structures of domination and how they can correct public discourses of dehumanization and prejudice. So interpretations aren't judged as right or wrong, but we talk about them and like, okay, what type of freedom does that bring real people in real life situations? Um, it's not looking for a right answer. It's looking for transformation and for meaning that can really transform our lived reality. So if you're familiar with the Jewish practice of, of Midrash, a lot of feminist biblical scholars talk about how their work is very much in line with the Midrashic approach to scripture. Um, and Elizabeth Schuschler Ferenza is talking about, in talking about this, quotes a Midrashic scholar who calls the Bible a palette of colors that an artist uses to create a painting, not the painting itself. So instead of the Bible being the painting that we have to see and understand, instead it's a sacred collection of tools that God is all in and through that we can use to paint a painting of God's liberation in our world. Um, and thus this it values multiplicity, multiple ways of understanding things. There's not this competition about which is the right interpretation, but rather this more celebratory dynamic um, reading of scripture. And so as we read to make meaning, not to be right, we can't read alone then. So the third hallmark of feminist biblical scholarship or interpretation is that it reads in community. So this book, Wisdom Ways, uh, interpreting fem or introducing feminist biblical interpretation, the whole like thesis of it is that feminist biblical scholarship is a dance with the scripture. 
Um, Schuschler Ferenza talks about how this interpretation moves in spiraling circles and circling spirals, how it's ongoing. It can't be done once and for all, but must be repeated differently in different situations from different perspectives. And this is what makes it exciting because in every new reading of the Bible, a different meaning emerges. And so she talks a lot about how the Bible is supposed to be read with others in a public forum and not in this privatized individual relationship with the Bible. If you have read Bell Hooks, Feminism is for everybody. She quotes this a lot. And in that book, Bell Hooks talks about the role of community of conscientizing groups, I think is what she calls them, and like acknowledging how feminism can be liberating for everybody. And in a similar way, it's when we read the Bible in communities and asking these questions, finding meaning together, um, that we find freedom and like the true voice of scripture. So by now, it's probably obvious this approach is a much more decentralized and democratic in its understanding of what the biblical authority is. The Bible is not the inerrant word of God that we must figure out, but biblical authority emerges in our dance with the scripture. So I want to introduce two more hallmarks, um, both of which use this fancy word, hermeneutics. If you don't remember that word, you don't need to. It's just a fancy word for like interpretive strategy. So just see that word and see interpretation. Um, so the fourth hallmark of feminist biblical interpretation is that it uses an a hermeneutics of suspicion. Elizabeth Schuschler Ferenza talks about how as biblical readers were taught to approach the Bible with this hermeneutics of respect, acceptance, consent, and obedience. But instead, a criminal feminist interpretation for liberation develops this hermeneutics of suspicion that places on all biblical texts the warning, caution, could be dangerous to your health and survival. So we see how that is needed for verses like 1 Corinthians 14. And there's another book called Texts of Terror that really impacts some of the very, like, kind of scary verses in the Bible that could really be used for some damaging outcomes in the world. And so this hermeneutics of suspicion looks out for this danger. It's suspicious of this danger, and it may be emotionally challenging or taxing because it's viewed as taboo. Again, we are told we're supposed to believe and trust in the Bible, not question it, not be suspicious of it. But I want to emphasize that this suspicion is not a suspicion of the Bible's worth. Rather, it believes that the Bible has something to say to us. So it's suspicious of what we might get out of that. Um, it's suspicious of the ways in which structures of domination and which patterns of oppression, of injustice, of patriarchy are baked into the Bible and naturalized, hidden, um, taken for granted and given to us as something we should just accept as fact. Like in 1 Corinthians 14, like, oh, this is just how it is. Women are supposed to be silent in church. No, this hermeneutics of suspicion challenges and demystifies the structures of domination inscribed into the biblical text and into our experience and our common sense world today. So it's suspicious of how oppression hides itself in our interpretation and our experience of um, reading the Bible. It's not suspicious of the Bible all out, but of the ways in which oppression is baked into it. So this suspicion is based on the knowledge that history is only ever a part of the story. And we know that history is often told by the victors, by those with power, most of which have been men. And what we know of history and even the history of early Christianity is a part of the picture. So while we are suspicious, we don't have to stop there. Um, the last hallmark of feminist biblical interpretation and I want you to introduce that will really help us next week as we remember the story of Mary Magdalene is this hermeneutics of remembering and reconstructing this approach of remembering and reconstruction so if we're suspicious because we know there have been stories hidden um, in the early parts of the Bible because of the androcentrism um, like we know the woman in Corinth we're teaching we're asking questions we're speaking this hermeneutics of remembering and reconstruction seeks to see what those stories might have been we may not know exactly. It may be a lot of hypothetical, but it's still worth exploring for the what ifs and what that might mean for our faith today. So this approach knows that history is not a transcript or report of what actually happened. Um, history is not some objective data of how things really were, um, but the, rather history um, is a part of the story. It's not reality, but a version or telling of reality. And thus that we can find with new historical imagination, new ways of understanding, even the history of the Bible and Christianity. Um, she talks about the need for the necessity of historical imagination um, for any knowledge of biblical texts and worlds, because imagination helps us fill in the gaps of and silences and thereby make sense of the text. We need imagination, this creative imagination of remembering and reconstruction um, because things have been hidden. We can reconstruct those stories. 
Um, so she talks about this as a, like quilt making, this remembering this history writing can be likened to the making of a quilt, she says, fitting all of the bits and pieces of information into a new design and model with this like radical egalitarian model of remembering. So this hermeneutic of remembering reconstruction seeks addresses that history has hidden some of the stories of early Christianity. That there were women teaching and speaking in the early church, but the, that has been hidden from us, but we can do what we can to uncover that and reconstruct that. Um, and offers a few, few tools for doing that. First, um, it assumes that women were present in biblical stories, even when they aren't named, unless it's said explicitly that only men were here. So we do this with the stories of the feeding of 5,000. It says that Jesus fed 5,000 men. So we assume that there were a lot more women and children there. So that's reconstructing some of that story. Um, this approach also sees prohibitions like 1 Corinthians 14 as prescriptive, not descriptive, and thus a sign that women were actually doing whatever they told they weren't supposed to, and maybe they had a good reason for doing it and not the people who were telling them to stop. Um, and then last, this uh, approach contextualizes texts in their environments so that we can reconstruct a more um, an alternative social movement for chains by naming like, okay, this was how things were back then. What can we do differently? Um, so it wrestles with scripture and its partial history to recover the forgotten past, both of women's victimization and of their struggles for survival and well-being. Um, so this hermeneutic in particular, but all of these tools will really come to life. I'm sure your heads are like buzzing right now with questions about what this means. Next week, when we dive into the story of Mary Magdalene and we remember her impact for our faith and our life today, we'll see this come to life. Um, in a minute, I'm going to offer something for y'all that you can do after this to kind of work through some of this. But for now, are there any questions? Ooh. This. Uh, is, could it be just that, uh, you know, those men were really insecure? I don't like to say things so simple and judgmental, but that might be some of it. I have known plenty of insecure men, so. I was saying that half in jest, but really only half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what about these women in early Christianity made them so insecure and what might we learn from their boldness, right? I'm always um, struck by the fact that whenever we're looking at these big topics, these big ideas, that there's this great sense I receive of knowing that when we look at things through these lenses, we have to take on so much more responsibility mm. than when we simply say the Bible is verbatim, the world happened in seven days, women are evil, there's nothing we can do about these things. I, I always love the fact that we're given this opportunity to be more engaged in and responsible for our Christianity, our Judaism, our, our Islam, whatever our ism is. And I, I love that, that we're given more of an opportunity to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a requirement. Hallelujah. The phrase that was in the back of my mind the whole time preparing for this is uncle ben's with great power comes great responsibility i know i was afraid of this like for so long i was told that the bible was the word of god and we just need to believe it and i was scared of it and then once i saw this lens kind of coming to me i was scared of it too but then i found that that's where the freedom is that it's scary but once you let go of needing it to be like one right thing you find so much more transformation and freedom i think and i think there are plenty of others uh, who agree in this call and elsewhere in many cultures women are feared hmm. because they give life Oof, hallelujah and in giving life, that means they have control of the population or whatever they're fearful of. So we had to be controlled or we would take over. You know, maybe it could be a good thing, but no, precisely. Oh, I think it could be, but, you know. But uh, I think initially it's because we were feared because we gave life. I hear that, I see that. The mad woman in Christianity's attic. 
<laughs> cool. So there's a lot tonight. Next week will be a little less woo and a lot more like working this out and more conversation, figuring out what it means for us today as I want to talk about what uh, Jane Shaver proposes as Magdalene Christianity, this thing that we can reconstruct from early Christianity that has a lot of traction for those of us who seek to embody Christianities that are liberative, emancipatory, justice oriented. Um, but I, in the handout that I'll send again in the chat in a second, um, I included a worksheet uh, you can't see it on this PowerPoint, but um, that invites you to read Mark 14, that story of the woman anointing Jesus, and it asks like six kind of open questions um, that will help you kind of tease out this, how this feminist biblical interpretive strategies play out when we're actually reading the Bible. So I would love for y'all to do this over the next week um, before you come. It's not real homework. You can just look at it for a few minutes, but I would ask that if you do look at it, don't do it alone. Do it with someone else. And I will be, if anybody wants to stay after this and work through this for like 20, 30 minutes after this, after we conclude, I'd be happy to work through this worksheet with y'all because feminist biblical interpretation is supposed to be done in a forum. Um, but I invite you to do that. And then next week when we come back, we'll see all of this kind of glue together and come to life. So tonight I've laid down the tools. Next week, we'll see it come together. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that this is good news. I think a lot of Jane Shaberg has gotten a lot of flack for her writing um, because people thought she was just trying to stir the pot. Um, but she stuck by it because she knew that this was good news, that there was something divine in this creative approach to the Bible. Next week, I know we'll see that more clearly if you can't already see it already. Um, so I want to close with a section of a sermon written by Jane Shaberg, who we'll read a lot more next year, that kind of captures um, some of this theory. And then I will say goodbye and stay on for any more questions that you may have, or if anybody wants to work through um, this worksheet, this that I put together for us tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and send those in and then turn off my screen so I can see y'all's faces. Um, and then read to y'all an excerpt from a sermon. This excerpt is called Breaking the Silence. And it reads, I have never given a sermon before, never been asked to, never been allowed to. I am a member, at least I say I am, of the Roman Catholic Church, 1.1 billion strong that does not ordain women and does not permit women to preach. Aside from this prohibition, I'm also a feminist biblical scholar. We are seen as man-hating, male-bashing, family-destroying, whose scholarship is biased, subjective, too optimistic, just plain wrong, not worth reading or debating. I mention this not just because giving a sermon is a novelty for me, but because the first thing that came to mind in preparing it was silence, or rather silencing. I was and am tempted to end right here, to go sit down and let us listen to the silence of millions of women Hear the boiling up of their ideas, their interpretations, their genius, their frustration, their hopes, their questions, all unspoken. What is it that many women want to say that is so unwelcome? Well, for one thing, that most of the women and children alive today will live and die in poverty, that we do not want this sort of world, that we must act to change it. Inside the silence, though, there is this buzzing, this laughing, this murmuring. When the official voices cease, or at least cease their domineering can't, we can hear better the bird song, the traffic, the wind, our own breathing, and our own beating hearts. We can hear something of the past that was not silenced and something happening in our own very interesting, crucial time. We can hear some shifting, some cracking open, maybe, hopefully, some great joy present and future. Amen. So I hope you'll join us next week as we explore what all of this can of worms that I've opened up really looks like put together and how it might mean something for us who seek to be Christian in new and creative ways today. Um, but for now, thank you for joining. And if you'd like to stay on for any questions or to work through um, a look at Mark 14, I invite Tyler, you Tyler, real quickly, besides thank you, Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has not yet registered but wants to be a part of the Brooks Wolf conversation on Thursday, you can go to the website and it's pretty prominently featured there how to do it. As of today, we had 546 people registered, so it's, uh, it's filling up quite nicely. So I hope you'll uh, tell others about it and register yourself. And thank you, Tyler, so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited for that.